What's up, guys? This is Characters, and coming to you live from Glasgow, Scotland, my home, where I am, where I've returned to. Um, two days ago, I got back, and it's awesome to be back. I've got my whole computer, my whole setup. It's nice and comfortable. No more lying on a crappy, uncomfortable mattress in a stupid marble-floored, baking hot room with mosquitoes everywhere, typing and recording on a crappy Italian laptop from like 2004. Nope. Back with the iMac. Back grinding again, coaching again, full capacity. Basically feels good. That's a wrong slide though to start with, so that doesn't feel quite so good. Um, I decided I'd condense the end of this series because, quite frankly, I'm just too excited to stop doing PowerPoints. I'm so sick of making PowerPoints. They're useful, um, they're fun, they're informative to an extent. Um, well, they are very informative, but there are a lot of a bit of a drag when all you've been doing, or all you've been able to do, because of your circumstances for the last however many months, has been a PowerPoint series, something that doesn't depend upon the legality of playing poker in the country you're in, or on a stable internet connection, neither of which I really had in my previous living conditions in Barry. But here in Glasgow, in the UK, I have everything, the right to gamble again in my own country, or play poker, as I should say, not really gamble as such, but yeah. Um, so it's good. This will be the last episode. I've decided to condense them into this last one. Um, I can do this pretty easily, I think, because I want to speak a bit more in practice rather than in theory. Everything's been a lot of theoretical stuff, so thanks for digesting it all. It's probably not been the easiest thing to stomach, but you've had other videos from other instructors coming out that have been a bit more practical. So, so yeah, I hope that I can now balance out by going on from here, making this video today, and then making a bunch of live plays of student review um, videos, either with a live sweat with a student or hand history reviews. A lot of me working with my students, so you can see that, because that's quite cool as well. Coaching Patchouli might make an appearance again as well, but she's very, very busy with um, PhD and things like that right now. She's got a blog on Grounder School now, I believe, that you can probably follow along with and find out what's going on with her. But yeah, um, she's maybe going to be too busy for me to do that series, but I'll see how it goes. Um, but loads more fun stuff coming up anyway. Um, so today we're going to finish the series of Common Pitfalls. It's been a bit of a, a massive ordeal. Um, but I hope you've got a lot out of it, and I hope that if you can manage to avoid these pitfalls um, in your game, then you will make a hell of a lot of progress a lot faster than you would otherwise if you fall into them all. Um, today we're continuing with the pitfall of dealing badly with aggression when you move up in stakes, or you play more aggressive games, or you play the same game for three years and then it gets more aggressive because it's 2014 and everyone's aggro as hell these days. But whatever the reason, you're going to need to be able to avoid the pitfall of dealing terribly with aggression because it causes till it ends people's poker careers and puts a big roadblock in the middle of things. Most people who make it out of the micro stakes alive fall victim to this pitfall and don't make it out of the small stakes alive, unfortunately. But hopefully with a little bit of help from this series and this these last few episodes, you can avoid that. So we're going to finish the series by looking at the common mistakes adjusting to aggression. First preflop and then postflop. We're going to start with some bad preflop adjustments, what I think are the most common ways that people over adjust or adjust badly when they try to react to an increase in 3 betting or 4 betting or 5 betting or all of the above um, because they've moved up in stakes. The most common symptom of knowing you've moved up in stakes is, uh, other than seeing that the money is different and having the memory of choosing to do so, is that the aggression is a lot more. Um, <clears throat> people will, this is manifested. Mostly in preflop behaviour, people tend to 3-bet or 4-bet or 5-bet a lot more than they would at the lower stakes. Post-flop aggression is also something that ramps up, particularly when you get to 100, 200. Um, I'm going to move on and then talk about some, some ways in which people deal badly with post-flop aggression. It's going to be a shorter um, presentation part of the video this time. We're only going to we're only going to go for like 15-20 minutes, I think, and um, talking about the theory of this stuff and talking about the main types of adjustments to avoid making, because we already covered that quite a bit before. I can scroll back and show you, because I'm now on the iMac and I don't have that presentation saved on here at the minute. If I go back, I probably end up, yeah, I end up in this ancient series called But Watch Your Range from before. Um, that's how lazy I am, I just kind of open a PowerPoint and then... Um, yeah, <laughs> end up adding something to the end of it. A bit disorganized, I should probably work on that. So yeah, 
after we've looked at the most common types of pre-flop and post-flop bad adjustments, we're going to look at some example hands, one of which I played last night, the other ones are just in my database. I've not had too much opportunity to play loads yet because I only got back on Tuesday, this is now Thursday, um, that I'm making this video, so it's not been long that I've been back in the country and there's a bunch of other stuff I need to do obviously as well. But yeah, going to be major priority to be grinding again soon so you guys will get some more up to date. Um, more in tune with the poker world kind of videos coming out with some some live action so that'll be fun um as for the experience i had in italy it was amazing it was a great experience one of the best in my life i'm very glad i did it despite all the whinging that i make about the third world conditions they're not really but um the bad internet and the terrible kitchen and all those things kind of spiral into insignificance in the light of the actual awesomeness of the experience as a whole. So yeah, I definitely recommend Italy. It's a place to go. A lot of beautiful places, a lot of nice people, very nice culture in a lot of ways. So yeah, I definitely recommend it. Just don't go there if you want to play online poker because you can't unless you're Italian, which is a bit of a, a snack for me especially. But yeah, let's go let's go forward now and we'll jump into this video. So bad pre-flop adjustments. We already talked before that over adjusting was really bad. Um, or adjusting in the wrong way was really bad. For instance, in that last example, where if Hero decided he would just stop c betting a board that he has every right to c bet with his range because it's much stronger than villains, then that's a bad adjustment to villain strategy of raising. He should find a better way to adjust rather than giving up so much EV in the form of a c bet strategy that could be really good. Um, I'm going to talk here more about different kinds of different kinds of bad adjustment more specifically. Um, the first one is called living in the moment and this is kind of when we just make an adjustment based on our hand and the exact situation we are in rather than actually having a strategy that we can use. Um, for example, people live in the moment too much when they say things like this. Villain is just 3-bet me for the third time in quick succession. That's it. Next time I have to 4-bet him to defend myself. So this is like a kind of really predictable way to play. It's a very we said that before that bad adjustments were either they were over adjustments or they were too obvious or they were the wrong kind. This is an example of one that's usually too obvious. If Dylan's just three bet you for the third time, then he's if he's not completely sort of out of tune with what's going on and zombified, then he's gonna be aware that you're aware that you've been three bet three times in quick succession. Therefore, he's probably expecting, since you're a regular, that you're going to play back at him in some way or another. So for you to just 4-bet your entire range next time is really going to be very exploitable and it's going to be something that he can take advantage of very easily just by being in tune with the game flow. I know that if I 3-bet someone 3 times I'm going to be a bit tighter the next time, I'm going to have more of a value range or I'm going to have 5-bet bluffs in my range and I'm going to be shoving over more. Something like that. So if you just kind of live in the moment you just say right I'm going to 3-bet next time because of this because he's been really aggressive. That's like very level one thinking. It's just above level zero. It's a very obvious, like not very good adjustment and it's likely to get you into quite a lot of shit. So what I'm going to be striving at here in this pre-flop section and also to some extent in the post-flop section as well is that an adjustment should be made with your range and not just with your hand. And that's something I'll touch on more later. But in this kind of situation, if you just take like a random hand that you've opened, like ace, I don't know, let's say, queen six suited that you opened on the button and you decide to four bet it just because you think villain's been out of line it's not really the best way to go about it and if villain is in tune with what's going on he has the opportunity to own you he's aware that you're feeling like you're being exploited that you're being bullied he's aware of that so he's going to be readjusting if he's sensible if he's just some autopilot three better and you know that then okay fair enough just four bet and make him fold with anything that's not a disaster but in general, a bit much better way to defend yourself here rather than making the obvious 4-bet the next time it comes around to you and the spot comes up is to actually have a range and have a frequency that you're going to 4-bet that you know is not like really exploitable. You have hands that are best suited for the job. So rather than just taking the random queen 6 suited because it was the next time and you said you were going to 4-bet in the next time, it's better to actually have a set range. Then when villain doesn't know this, you might have to fold a few times, but overall, in the long run here, um, if you look at EV over over the actual long haul against this guy, you have a strategy that's basically watertight or it's sound and it combats aggression because you design your ranges so that you make sure that the hands you choose 
form enough combos of your range so that you're not folding too much to 3-bets. You might 4-bet bluff with certain suited aces because they're very suitable, or suited kings because they're very suitable hands, they have blockers. Um, but you're not just 4-betting everything, and better yet, your 4-bet strategy is actually randomised to the cards that you're dealt and not to the dynamic. And it's therefore a pretty good way of combating a very aggressive, dynamic, sort of hungry regular who might outplay you if you just try to fight back in the sort of most obvious way that you see fit. You might well get owned doing that, but if you have a strategy, villain can own himself against it, he can, you know, tell himself all these different things are happening, he can level himself into making mistakes, when all you're doing is playing a strategy that ensures that over the long run you're not getting exploited, you're not having to fall too much, basically. So living in the moment too much can be a dangerous thing, especially when you make very level one adjustments and try to fight fire with, like, absolute, just brute force fire in a most predictable way. People are smarter than that these days, that doesn't work. Um, it's very easy to be taken advantage of when you play in that kind of way. But this is a very natural pitfall that people fall into because when they move up in stakes and they get the adrenaline flowing and they, the thing they don't want, like if you're a little dog, it's like little dog syndrome, right? In Barry, there are always these small dogs and then there were these enormous gigantic dogs like the size of cars. Now these car-sized dogs would sort of just bound about all happy and free, just sort of sniffing the little dogs. But man, the little dogs were just like going crazy. They were so tilted because the big dogs, the car-sized dogs, were just massive. So the little dogs were coming up and snarling and growling and running away and barking. And that's kind of what you're doing when you move up in stakes and you get tilted really quickly because of the aggression. The dogs are bigger. You can see that. You feel like a little dog. You're threatened. You start barking your ass off. It's just going to get you into trouble. It's not going to work. Um, you need to be a bit more clever than that and have a strategy. So don't be like one of the little yappy dogs. Be like, become one of the car-sized dogs. I don't know why in, in Italy they have these dogs that are just like bigger than anything I've ever seen before. I'm talking like bigger than, bigger than cows, some of them. They're just absolutely enormous. Not like fatter than cows, but you know, taller and sort of more grand. Anyway, enough of that ranting about dogs. But yeah, don't take the level one adjustment. Remember that living in the moment is okay, and sometimes it's very, very important to be in tune with game, with game flow and to know what villain's expecting and to have some idea what his mindset is. And you can form your strategy around that, but don't do the obvious thing. Let play a strategy and let sort of variance determine when and where you do things. Randomize it. That's what your strategy does. It ensures that over the long run you're playing well, but over the short term you're randomized and you're protected and you're not doing things because you're losing control and acting out in emotion or whatever and over-adjusting, obviously. You're doing things because it's in your calculated strategy and you know it's good in the long run. Now, that's not to say that you should never just make a play based solely on game flow. Sometimes you should, but you should do so when you're confident that you have an information edge over villain. That's to say, you think you can easily win this war of exploiting each other. For example, you've seen villain make a certain 4-bet size three times when he's had air and a different size twice when it has value hands. That's like an amazing read. That's something very specific. Then you can deviate from your strategy. You see that size, you just like shove your whole range over it as a bluff because you know that villain's got a horrible, horrible sizing tell or whatever. Or the dynamic is such you're just like so in, in tune with the flow of the game that you just know that villain's going to fold all his air this time. He's not going to mess with you so you decide to four bet him. Something like that. That's fine. But as long as you've got the upper hand and you've actually got a lot more information than Villain does, and you know what's going on, and you're in tune, and you're actually in the zone playing your, your B-plus game or your A game or whatever, then it's cool. But just diving right in there and doing the obvious thing as an over-adjustment is not cool. Play your range instead, have a strategy, don't live solely in the moment, live for planning your strategy out against Villain. The best way to protect yourself from pre-flop heightened aggression is to actually have a concrete strategy that you go in with that can settle your nerves, make you confident, and assure you that you're not playing horribly and you're not getting owned, even if it feels like you are, because you keep getting dealt the bottom of your range or whatever. In the long run, it will even out. Okay. Another thing that, another pitfall of this nature is poor hand selection. So this is kind of interlinked with the previous pitfall, but Hero notices that middle position has been four betting. All of Hero's three bets, I should say. Sorry about the random repeat of the word there. And he says, that's it, I'm jamming the 7-9 over him. So again, like if you think about this in the long run, it might be barely plus EV to do this, it might not. Villain might be expecting it, it might be an over-adjustment, who knows. But 
jamming nine synths suited over a format is like definitely not the best way to adjust to it because you're going to have all these hands in your range that are just so much stronger and have much better equity against villains for that call it off range. You might have pocket pairs, you might have ASEX suited or whatever. The point is that you've got all these hands that just do way, way better when called, whereas 7 9 suited does pretty damn badly. Let me show you what I mean really quickly um, with the help of my um, stove program that seems to have disappeared. Poker Cruncher is the one. For example, if we just clear all this, this is some work I was doing with some students earlier. So let's just say reset all. For example, if we give villain a stacking off range, that's just like a standard kind of jacks plus ace king kind of thing. This is four bet call range. So when he four bets you, I mean you can get all funky with your seven nine suited, your nine seven of spades. We calculate this equity right here. Um, you only have twenty eight percent, whereas there are a bunch of other hands in your range where you just have way more equity with that you should use instead. Um, for example, if we give you instead pocket fives, you can see that the equity is going to jump up above 30, 33%. Considerable difference. In the long run, that 7% difference is going to equate to a lot of extra EV. So, it's definitely a good idea to not just do things based on not living the moment and not just select a hand at random. But again, playing a good strategy equates to having certain hands um, singled out that you're going to use for these kind of plays. So if you want to play back at a light 4 better, and you know he's disrupting your rhythm, he's 4 betting you every time you 3 bet, don't just randomly shove 7 9 suited, but start 3 betting more selectively. Start 3 betting low pocket pairs so you can shove them over him. Start 3 betting suited aces because they have better equity and they block his nuts. These kind of things. Don't just take two random non blockers. And in fact, a non blocker actually makes it more likely the villain has one of the the very best hands like aces or ace king or whatever because it just doesn't block anything at all. It in fact blocks some of this bluffing range instead. So so yeah. That's an interesting concept, blocking someone's bluffing range. Seven nine suited isn't the biggest culprit for it because people don't bluff too much with hands with sevens and nines in them. Hands with like queens and jacks, however, they tend to block quite a bit of people's bluffing ranges thereby making it more likely they have their top value range ace x kind of ace king ace ace kind of stuff a little bit but yeah so the point is be thoughtful be planned have a strategy don't just live in the moment and have a knee-jerk reaction to aggression it's not the best way to go about it be thoughtful and think through everything okay there's another type of over adjustment or pitfall of over adjustment and i call it paranoid over adjustment and it's often really, really irrational. The quote here is, every time I do anything they play back at me, I am getting owned. Sometimes you are getting owned, but variance is always such a big factor. Whether you are or you are not getting owned, there will always be times when you have to fold all the time. Sometimes it's because villains are being more aggressive, sometimes it's because they're just picking up the nuts, sometimes it's a bit of both. In fact, most often it's a bit of both. But you have to be very wary that you don't jump to this conclusion of they're all playing back at me all the time. Because it's most of the time it's not true. Most of the time they are just running hot and you're getting the bottom of your range and having to fold. And when they have the top of your range and you have the bottom of yours, you should be folding. So that's good. But it feels frustrating and it doesn't feel like that sometimes. So paranoid over adjustment is when it's just one of those days where every time you 3-bet you get 4-bet, every time you 2-bet you get 3-bet, every time you 4-bet you get 5-bet and you never have the nuts. And it sucks. But it's not the end of the world. Everyone has to go through these, these streaks. In fact, everyone does go through these streaks. So you just have to figure out how to limit the damage when it happens. Inevitably, you're going to have to fold a bunch, your red line is going to go down, you have to just minimise the damage. So how do you do that? You avoid the knee-jerk reaction of just fighting back every time, just sort of, that's it, I'm 4-betting, I'm not going to fold, that's it, I'm 5-betting, just playing really aggro. Again, if you have a strategy, you will be dealt the top of your range sometimes as well, and the hands, on average, you're going to be dealt all of your range equally, so it's not a big deal. It's not that you're going to be dealt the bottom of your range more just because of this. So on average, if they are actually doing this, if they are actually being really, really aggro, at least you have a strategy where overall in the long run you're not going to be getting beaten up because you have stronger hands in your range. Remember that. When you fold the bottom of your range, you're not it's usually okay because that's the part of your range that your strategy has you planning to fold. So 
don't get too caught up in the short term variance of a streak where you have to fold all the time. Instead, just think to yourself calmly that, okay, this happens, I'm limiting the damage right now that I'm going through this bit of annoying bad variance of an annoying type but it's okay, they're probably not owning me as much as I think they are, it might be a bit more aggressive, but this is also variance having a very large say in what's going on right now. Remember that variance always has a very large say in the short term, so don't let short term streaks like this get you tilted or get you down or make you um, furious and make you make these sort of over adjustments or obvious adjustments. So remember that people make strong hands they get dealt ace-ace. Sometimes you can toss seven heads in a row with a coin, and sometimes when it rains, it pours because of the variance of it. Um, be patient, keep playing your strategy. You know, someone can toss seven heads, it happens a lot, and just in the same in the same vein, someone can get dealt ace-ace three times in ten hands. One time I was playing poker in a tournament, and I got aces, aces, kings, kings, and four hands. So, you know, this stuff, this stuff happens. Not all the time, but every now and then it happens. Keep playing your strategy. Be patient. Don't deviate from your strategy and start playing horribly. And obviously so just because you're frustrated. So those are three of the common pre-flop pitfalls for sure. Um, let's take a minute now and look at some pre-flop hands so we can emphasize this more. Then I'll move on to talking about the bad post-flop adjustments and look at hands for them. So let's go into Poker Tracker. And the pre-flop hands... Start from here, I think. If I just say replay, sorry guys, I should have had this set up already. I did, but then I had to close down the program for some reason earlier. Um, replay all hands and report. And let me just make this the right size. see that okay hopefully. Um, that's a post flop hand so let's move forward and we'll start from here. These are not like exciting hands, I'm, I'm picking quite mundane spots on purpose just to show you and I'm going to give a hypothetical situation. You can see here that we've got one guy with a 13% 3 bet but it's only over 15 hands and we've got one guy with a very high 15% 3 bet, that's this number here on the HUD over 364 hands which is a bit more reliable. Therefore we can probably infer that we're going to get 3-bet here a lot between these two players, especially this one, who we know 3-bet's really wide. So here, our strategy should be to not open so wide on the button, to min-open most of our opens, and to have a clear plan about what hands we're going to 4-bet to make villains 3-bets not so great, and what hands we're going to be able to flat to make villains 3-bets not so great. So we're going to have a strategy, we're going to have a plan that we can use to combat this. So, A6 suited is the kind of hand that can either fall into the call or four bet camp. It's probably not going to be a fold. It's just too high up in the order of things playability wise and it has a blocker. So folding a six suited here against these two guys doesn't really make any sense. So I prefer a min open here. I don't like my sizing at all, but I was obviously a fish and decided to 2.5x, definitely better than min open when you're against guys who are three betting this much because you are on the button. You still have a widest range. You're still gonna have to fold a fair amount and you want to be folding and leaving less money behind and you're not really gaining too much by making this 250. As well you get villains a worse price on your 3-bet, usually they need to make it a bit bigger when you min open otherwise they give you a great price so their kind of risk, their risk reward ratio is worse as well so that's good for you. So definitely good to go $2 here not 250 but anyway as played we go 250, it's quite an old hand. Um, villain makes 850 so he's making Fairly small-ish um, three bet for the size of the pot here. Uh, we could definitely call this as well, or we could four bet. Depends what our strategy is. But this hand is definitely one that we can defend. We're not four betting arbitrarily because if you bring up poker stove here, let me just show you how I look at this. I just call it stove. I know it's not anymore. It's poker cruncher, but whatever. Let's reset all. Stop first and reset all. Um, for example, if we we want some kind of balanced range, let's say we 4-bet and stack off with this kind of stuff against these players because they're pretty aggro and we need to have some value combos too so we can bluff a lot and defend a lot. Here we have 5 by 6 is 30 combos of pair plus 16 is 46 combos. So if we want to have some kind of range that's quite balanced here, 
that makes it difficult for a villain to... A villain four bets us, or three bets us, like, immediately he needs us to fold here. Let's work this out. So he's making it 850 um, to win three plus his 850. So he needs us to fold. Let's bring the old calculator onto onto screen. Um, 850 plus three is 11. 1150 total pot. Bet to bet plus pot. Simple poker math, guys. You need to know this stuff. So 850 into 1150. It's 74 percent. So he doesn't actually need us to fold that amount because he has options post flop. He can see bet effectively. He should be able to select his post flop action so that he improves upon that number because he has a lot of choices post flop. It's not just that we win the pot every time we call. We don't. He wins sometimes. He see bets and takes them. And sometimes he stacks us. So really this amount is probably like, I don't know, 60% or something instead. Um, so if we estimate it at around 60%, this is just very rough, um, then that's how often we need to be folding. So we can work out a range so that we're not folding that often, basically. By A, limiting our opening range, that's part of our strategy. And then B, Going in here, we can make sure that we 4-bet enough combos so that we're not folding too often. Um, I'm not going to sit and do this, it's going to take way too much time, and I've done this in previous videos. Look at the video, the series What's Your Range um, that I made before. That covers all this stuff in detail, so I'll refer you back there if you want to see this in more detail. But we can plug in a range now to balance with this to make sure that we have a set amount of... 4-bit bluff hands and then plenty of hands we can flat, like these suited broadways and stuff. We make sure they're not too big a part of our opening range, then we're protected. Then it doesn't really matter what happens, we don't need to feel exploited. Why? Because we have a strategy that we can play that we've designed to make sure that we are playing well against this aggression. And then we don't need to worry about a hand-to-hand -hand basis. Are we being owned? Are we being soul red? Are we not? It's not important, our strategy is good. So, in this situation, um, it's not so relevant. Um, like this hand exactly is just basically a token of, it's an instance of our strategy. We have one of the hands that we're going to have, so we see what our strategy says we should do with it. And in the strategy, probably we're going to either call or forbit. Let's say we're going to forbit this hand, and that's fine for us to do because it's consistent with our strategy. We make it a nice size that gives villain a no, like it's basically giving us a very good price on the bluff if it's nice and balanced. And with our value, we can just use the same size and still, you know, get it in very easily. Villain can shove over this if he wants, um, or he can not. And at the same time, it doesn't give Villain a great price to shove over our bluff and just win lots of money. If we make this like 22 here, that's just far too big. Villain can shove all day, we're just burning so much money for no reason. So 17 is good here. Um, but the main point I want to make is that this hand has nothing to do with He's doing this, so I'm going to do this to exploit him. We don't really know. Villain is 3-betting a lot. Yes, we've designed a strategy to make sure we 4-bet bluff enough to protect ourselves and that we're not um, folding way too much, and therefore Villain's not exploiting us. So now that we've done that, and we know we're not getting exploited in the long run, we just play our hand as our range dictates that we should, and we're happy about it. Yes, sometimes we might have some read on this so epic guy, Maybe 850 is his bluff sizing, I don't know. Maybe he's really tilted, I've just seen him lose a pot and he's gone into aggro 3-bet mode. And if he's done that, then maybe we want to defend even more and raise our 4-bet bluff combos. So they vastly outnumber like what they did before. But without that, we just play the strategy we've decided upon. It doesn't need to be exact, but a nice rough strategy to make sure we're not folding too much. And here we have a 6-suited, which is a hand we're going to 4-bet as per that strategy. That's all there is to it. Nothing else is important. I'm not saying, oh, yeah, look at his 3-bet percentage, he's so aggro, I'm going to 4-bet him for the hell of it, you know, with like 7-4 off here. Not that I'd open that hand, but you get the point. <clears throat> well, I would open it on some buttons, but not against these two guys, just to clarify. So yeah, A6 suited, I'm playing my range, I'm playing my strategy, I 4-bet the hand, but it's not because I'm reacting out of anger or making an obvious adjustment, it's because it's part of my solid long ball strategy against this guy. Okay, let's look at another hand. <clears throat> so, here we have 8-9 off on the button instead. <coughs> Folds round to us, we make a men open, 
against two relatively unknown. Well, I've got one wreck in a small blind who three bets nine percent from the small blind. He's three betting. I can't see that. Doesn't matter. Um, let's just say nine percent. Quite a lot. He makes it seven. Gives us a relatively good price here. And yeah, he's three betting a lot. So do we need to defend ourselves? Well, yes, but we're already doing that with our strategy. We don't need to defend ourselves with this hand. It's near the bottom of our button opening range. We're clearly not going to be opening the button with any two cards here when we've got this three better guy in the small blind. Therefore, we don't really care. So what do we do here? We fold, as we should, because we have a hand that we've deemed too weak to flat. Sometimes you might be able to flat this. We are a bit deeper if you've got good reads, blah, blah, blah. Also, notice here, stacks are really nice for four betting because it gives Villain an even worse price if he wants to shove over, but they're not so deep that he can like 5-bet bluff very easily without going all in. So because of that, they're a bit more advantageous. Maybe we change our strategy so that we 4-bet bluff a bit more because stacks are good. We add in an extra 30 combos of hands, an extra 6 suited hands or whatever. That's fine. But anyway, the point is that we play our strategy. This hand is too low down to call and it's not suitable as a, as a four bit bluff, so it doesn't become a four bit bluff as per this strategy. Instead, we simply fold it and we know that overall we're playing fine. Even if this is the third time in a row that builds three bet us, that's a good thing. We've not reacted stupidly by playing an unsound strategy. We've not decided to just go ahead and four bet this hand and then get shipped on just out of anger for the dynamic. We're playing a strategy that we know is good and we're going to stick to that, so we fold. So that, those two hands basically, as simple and as boring as they are, I think they basically illuminate what's important here and the main point I'm trying to make to you guys. There's one more hand I want to show you about. In fact, no, let's save this hand for post-flop, in fact. So we'll have three hands to talk about um, post-flop here that I think are all pretty cool. But first, let's go back to the presentation and... Let's talk about bad post-flop adjustments in theory before we jump into the, the practical illumination of it. Okay. So, the dubious hero call. This is the first type of bad post-flop adjustment, pitfall, whatever you want to call it, that I see fairly frequently. The dubious hero call happens if villain is exploiting you well, no, this is not when it happens, this is my rant afterwards, but it happens when Hero decides that he's being exploited by Villain. The Villain is bluffing too much, and therefore Hero beats Villain's bluffs because he has a quote-unquote bluff catcher, even though it's very weak, maybe it's like bottom pair or ace high or something. So Hero says, I'm going to Hero call this river, and hits the call button, hoping to fist pump with pride when he's right. Hero calling can be really good if you want to play exploitively and you've got a very good idea of the villain is bluffing in that situation or bluffing way, way too much overall or something like that. But if it's just the case that you've been shown some aggression, then it doesn't make sense to be calling down with a hand so weak as like the bottom of your showdown value. Why is that? Because then you're calling down with everything and then you're playing quite exploitably because if you're wrong, you're just calling absolutely everything down and maybe just getting completely valued on their own, who knows. So, yes, you might be getting exploited, you've noticed villain's aggressive, the stake is aggressive, you've moved up and experienced a lot of heightened aggression since doing so, but that doesn't mean that you need to hero call down like fairly readless just because you've seen more aggression in general. It's not a good idea. And here's why, because if villain is exploiting you, he's exploiting your range, not your hand. Let's think about that. When you exploit an opponent, you say, I think his range is weak here. I think he has a lot of pocket pairs that have to fold on this river. I think he has a lot of missed draws, so I'm going to bluff catch this river with everything, etc. You don't say, okay, Villain has 10-8 suited of clubs, so he has a straight here, so I'm going to exploit him by folding. No, that's called like psychic ability, and unfortunately, most of us don't have that at poker, thankfully, because then we just get totally owned all the time. So... Hero, villain is exploiting Hero's range, not his hand. So Hero should defend with his range, not his hand, unless he has a very good read or tell that makes us want to play very exploitably. If we have that, then sure, go ahead and Hero call. If you're sure 
or you've got a good idea that villain is just really unbalanced towards bluffs, then sure, hero call, call everything, exploit him. The more unbalanced villain is, and the more you know about it, the more unbalanced you can be. However, if you've just stepped up and you're just seeing this heightened aggression, and you're on the river with bottom of the pair, and you're sick of being tripled today because it's happened a lot, don't call for those reasons. It's a bad idea, it's a bad pitfall, and it's a huge mistake if you replicate it time and time again. So, avoid that. So defend with your range, not your hand. What does that really mean? Well, it means make sure that you're calling some percentage that if you're worried that you're getting bluffed, makes villains bluffs like indifferent or slightly bad or whatever, but don't go crazy over the top and just call them with everything. Remember, you have a range. You can make sure that you're not getting exploited by playing that range and playing a strategy. You do not need to make hero calls based on no information, but please do make them when you've got good reads and yeah, hand reading somewhat of a a lost art these days with all the sort of player range GTO stuff that people preach about. So of course I'm not saying don't hand read and don't get soul reads on people. Do that if you can. But when you don't have these good reads, don't just hear a call for the sake of it. Play your range and defend with that. We'll see we'll see this instantiated in actual situations in a minute. <clears throat> Obvious re-aggression is also bad. Avoid lashing out without equity, where your value range doesn't lash out in such a way, I should say. Um Imagine you're on the flop and it's like a dry flop and you see bet and get raised and when you have a set or an overpair you just call because the board's so dry and you want villain to keep bluffing. doesn't make sense to three bet bluff. If villain knows that you're tilted or he's been attacking you a lot on the flop and then you just decide to three bet bluff a hand with no equity, that's again, it's just like before in the previous thread when we were living in the moment too much and we made the obvious snap readjustment. <clears throat> we don't want to do that. We want to instead play some kind of strategy. Maybe we have some 3-bet bluffing range, but it doesn't really make any sense if we're not 3-betting our strong hands for value. So we want to float instead. We want to just think about it. Don't just make really unbalanced, obviously horrible, you know, obvious outbursts of aggression that are just clearly um, being made for the sake of it because you're getting pissed off. Instead, play a strategy. Think, be smart. How would you play your value hands in this spot? You would float with them. You would call with them. Therefore, you should float with your bluffs as well and try and take it away on a future street. Otherwise, you're just going to look like exactly what you are, full of shit. Um, you can, obviously, this can be extended to the next level where it follows that you should 3-bet value hands because villain's going to think that they're um, really, that it looks really dodgy and stuff. So you can do that as well. Um, you can like always, you have the option to start being exploitable and start trying to take it to villain in the war of exploitability, but sometimes it's just not going to be the best, especially when it's obvious to villain. So avoid obvious re-aggression. There are better ways to adjust. Um, play your range, play your, play your bluffs as villain would perceive you to play your value hands. That's quite important. How does he think you're going to play a set on that board? He probably thinks you're going to call. So why would you just start three betting? it's likely going to get clicked back in your face and you're going to have to make a tilted slam the mouse fold, which is not going to do, do you any favours. <clears throat> the next pitfall I call scared money. Well, I don't really call it that. It's a very famous term. You've heard this a lot, I'm sure. Scared money, where you think um, all sorts of all sorts of irrational, emotional thoughts basically governed by the emotion of fear when you're afraid of losing money because you've moved up or you've already lost too much for your liking or whatever. So you start to purposely avoid risks even when it's advantageous for you to take risks. That's to say you try to reduce variance more than you try to increase EV, which is always a silly thing to do. You can, incre you can decrease your variance if it's indifferent to your EV, if it doesn't have an effect on your EV. But as soon as avoiding variance leads to actual mistakes by folding too much, then it's going to be really bad. But one adjustment that people make to heighten aggression is they just tighten right up and just knit it up and wait for the nuts. And that's not going to be the best idea either because you just miss out on so many opportunities. For example, if you're on the button and you want to be stealing wide because it's like a weaker player in the big blind but the small blind three bets you like all day, it's not a good idea to just become a knit on the button because you miss out on so many opportunities to, to get into a good spot against this big blind fish because you're so worried about the small blind 3-betting all the time. Um, so 
in that kind of situation, instead of being like scared money about it and waiting for premium hands, what you need to do instead is find an alternative strategy of how you can get the best of both worlds, how you can react to these three bets um, without being scared money. So one example is, I'll just check back in case he raises the turn again. I'll just fold because the pot is unpleasantly big. These kind of thoughts are scared money thoughts. If you have these, there are ways that you can remedy them. You can work on your mental game, for sure. Um, try to objectify things in your mind. There are some good books out there. Um, I think there's a guy called Jared, is it Jared Taylor or something like that? I can't remember the guy's last name. Um, the Mental Game of Poker, it's called, which is a really good read. I've recommended it before. I've also got a series that's like roughly based on the same kind of ideas from these books um, about the mental game that you can check out on Grammar School as well. Um, so definitely do that if you've just moved up and you're experiencing scared money. Um, scared money is an adjustment. People don't see it as an adjustment, but it's an adjustment to height and digression that you can't handle, and it's a sort of flight response out of the fight or flight choice. The obvious readjust. The obvious reaggression and the dubious hero call, these are fight responses. Scared money approach is a flight response. But the brain will go into this mode, it's how you're wired. You will choose flight or fight, and sometimes you will choose flight in the form of this um, scared money. So you want good bankroll management, warm up before sessions, get yourself into the right frame of mind to really play and to be objective about it so that losing like a, a stack doesn't bother you. That's like so important. So if you're in, we talked about this last time when we spoke about um, warm-ups before. When we spoke about imagination and how people weren't in the right frame of mind to play an imaginative good game. Um, one of the reasons is because they haven't done enough of a warm-up or they don't have a good warm-up routine in place. Um, and similarly, scared money is like an irrationality. It's like an effect of not being in the right frame of mind. So if you can get yourself into that right warmed-up state first, then you're in much better stead. Okay, so these are three bad adjustments you can make post-flop. There are loads. Again, they all hinge around playing your hand in a vacuum instead of your range, acting impulsively and on too low a level that's obvious for your opponent to see what you're doing, or being irrational and being scared and taking the flight response. These are three different kinds of, three different ways that you can make bad adjustments to aggression post-flop. There are many, many more. Have a think about what else you could do and try and eliminate it. These are just three examples. Okay, so that's the end of the PowerPoints. You'll maybe be pleased to hear for a while. I don't think I'll be making another theoretical lecture series soon, um, but I'll be making lots of cool stuff instead. 